as we uh, as we migrate from the economics of of Canada as a whole, which is kind of broad based, really macro, which is what we were just talking about. Let's jump in, I think, to the real estate market update, uh, because that's quite fascinating, Patrick. There's a lot of things moving and shaking uh, in the uh, in the you know, in the real estate, we got some great charts to show in terms of where the market's going on different parts of the segment, like, for example, construction. Uh, we got mortgage rates. We got amortizations. We got listings. We got all kinds of different things. And again, this update, folks, is relatively broad based. We're going to be talking about provinces in general. So the economic update was kind of Canada as a whole there, which, uh, as you know, as real estate investors, we're not really concerned. We're not as concerned with what's happening. I mean, we want Canada to do well. But what we really want is our region uh, to specifically be doing well. So that's Canada. Now let's dive into a real estate market update, specifically on the provincial, Patrick. I think the first thing that's interesting is this. RBC came out with an um, interesting new report that says 43% of its residential mortgages have an amortization period longer than 25 years. That's as of July, and that's up from 40% a year earlier that means three percent it's went from 40 to 43 percent but here's the kicker it's 20 it was 26 percent in january of 2022 that means it's doubled just about doubled uh in terms of amortization now we've been telling real estate investors actually for the last probably six eight months that this is what the banks are doing they're not letting people go into default they're raising amortizations which is why you're not seeing a lot of defaults out there but you are seeing amortizations that are lengthy. You know, you had someone that used to have a mortgage for 18, 17, 15 years, and now their mortgage is reamortized to 25, 28, 30. I have one mortgage up to 32 years now. Wow. Yeah, I mean, this is the bank's reaction to it. And and you got to look at it and go, the bank doesn't want to own your real estate. So they're going to do whatever they can to support you. Most banks will. There's going to be instances where you're going to hear stories about how they didn't do that. But as you look at this chart that you've got up, you know, about monthly mortgage payments required to purchase a typical home. I mean, th at the end of the day, uh, you see a significant increase. And so let's just, you know, we need to extrapolate on this though, JG, and, and remember that yes, payments are going up. We can talk about what it takes to qualify for a mortgage. But in this conversation, let's look at the cost of carrying a home, carrying a piece of property, going to drive rents from a, a landlord point of view, a rental housing provider point of view. But on the economic side of things, people have less income, less discretionary income because they're busy paying for a mortgage, paying for food, paying for fuel. That cost of living is increasing and discretionary income is going to shift. It already is shifting, by the way. And that, in fact, will slow down an economy. So back to interest rate increases, by the way. This is where Bank of Canada is going to have to make some tough decisions. And uh, hopefully they make the right decision. And I, for me, the right decision is continue to pause and let this whole leg work through the system because there's a lot of catch up to do. This is interesting though. What I love about this chart, Patrick, it goes to show, and we often, you often say it in your own loving way, because you're always talking so positively about the government. <laughs> but but uh, what's interesting is oftentimes the government is, uh, you know, they try to do what they think is the right thing. And here's a good example of affordability was always already at midpoint 2022, as you can see in this chart, midpoint 2022, which is when rates started going up. That was the moment where people... Uh, affordability was at its lowest and their changes in the last 15 months has only done one thing and that has made affordability even worse uh and that this chart just shows you exactly that well let's you know let's just get back to what drove all of this to begin with you know when the uh pandemic hit they shut everything down they flood money into the market and of course that is what we're paying the price for now a total overreaction to what the pandemic was all about the flooding of capital into the markets i mean that in itself is totally related to inflation full stop point is this is that when we look at the cause much of what the government is doing or even the central banks are doing and this is at a global scale is really putting band-aids fighting fires that they created and they're running out of i guess tools to use and so this is where it gets really kind of dicey of what moves will they make but i can say this is that if they don't get really clear on uh the lag in terms of letting things work through the system i think we're in trouble and i don't necessarily believe that uh, they see it that way so we'll see We'll see. All right, Patrick, here's another great chart actually about uh, single family housing starts. Again, if you, you know, people, you know, people quickly forget. I know and, and 
myself, yourself, everyone here, we, we forget really quickly, but it was in fact only uh, in, in the early parts of 2022 when all these new government regulations were coming out in Ontario, they came out, uh, you know, the, the, the federal government was uh, spewing all these various things about pushing housing, pushing housing, pushing housing. And we thought, okay, we're going to go on a construction boom. We're going to go on a, on a tear here. Watch the supply. Patrick, you and I were sitting on this very show saying, I don't think so. Wait until you see this will not work its way through the system. This is all just headlines. And now we're starting to see the realities of that because look at single family housing starts, Patrick. They are down to a low that we haven't seen, well, ever on this chart. Yeah, well, that goes back to 2010. So at the end of the day, we've talked about this many, many times. The government is not going to fix this problem, whether it be federal, provincial, municipal. Uh, they continue to get in their own way. And I don't know how they're going to deal with this. So we've got single family and this is single family detached. And whether we look at it and say single family, it could be small multi, it could be a duplex, tri triplex. At the end of the day, the supply is not growing it's actually decreasing and you know there's a lot of reasons for that not the least of which is the cost of doing business the cost of materials don't forget there was a time where you know builders had trouble getting supplies and then they had trouble getting labor and then there's of course the rising costs of capital so i don't see this changing in a big way in a big hurry hmm. i see your point so when we look at single family detached, and you and I have talked about this many times, is when we look at detached properties, that's the sweet spot for uh, investors, I believe, to really capitalize and uh, grow their portfolio. And whether they're buying single family and converting to a duplex or triplex, whatever that combination of things might be, uh, expanding on lots, you know, as you and I have talked about many times and you've done is, you know, those laneway units, uh, those are, are ways to take this because that's the gap. That is the gap that is uh, needing to be filled. And what's interesting is you see this showing up in the real estate investments uh, in building construction. You can see that chart there. And this is going to work its way through. This has a lagging effect, Patrick. The fact that we're at an, an all-time low for building and for, for housing starts, this will have a ripple effect for many years to come, which is one of the reasons why when, when you speak as a real estate investor, if you're speaking to your broke neighbor who's like, you're investing in real estate, are you crazy? This is what they don't understand is the fact that we're at, we're at all time lows in terms of housing starts, in terms of building construction. This is only putting upward pressure on prices in the long term. Now, right now you have the influencer called higher interest rates, which is keeping things suppressed. But I think you're gonna see an incredible bull run in the, in the real estate market once the interest rates start to stabilize and once things start to flatten out, they don't even have to go down a whole lot, Patrick. I think that once things stabilize and, and investors start to feel like, okay, I can actually have a shot at this now, they'll figure out a way to make real estate profitable because there's going to be a ton of upward pressure in the next two, three, five years on real estate. And I think you're going to, you see it in those two charts if you're looking far enough ahead. So let me break it down this way, JG, and yes to all of your points. And I think that you hit on something that we don't want to step over. It's a good entry point, which is in terms of interest rates are an influencer. Are they high? Yes. Are they going to get higher? Maybe. Are they going to stay high forever? Absolutely not. No. And, you know, to that end, I'm, you know, I'm in my own portfolio where I've had to renew some mortgages. I've taken short term stuff. I've even had one that I left open uh, because I believe interest rates are going to come back down. Now, do I think they're going to go to 2%? No, but I really do see them coming back into that 4% range over the next couple of years. But here's the point. In, if you as an investor can see into the future, create a thesis and go, you know something, I can live with this interest rate right now. I can live with you know uh, break even or minimum cash flow or whatever strategy you put in place. The point is, is that if you're looking for those great opportunities, those great deals, because there's more and more coming onto the market, you see the gap that needs to be filled. Uh, I think that, you know, just by having some good planning and looking at what's really going on. And, and listen, JG, you know as well as I do, it's not easy getting capital for investment real estate right now from the banks. None of this is easy, which is actually what sets savvy, educated, sophisticated investors apart from everybody else. This is actually the time to get in and take advantage of those opportunities. That's what I got to say about that. Well, so Patrick, uh, it's never, it's, you say it's not easy now and I agree with you, but it's never been easy, dude. You've been doing this for over 20 years. It's never been easy. 
It's I, it's been I easier. Been easier. It no, has easy, been easier. Yeah. Easier is not easy. It's only you know. relative to how difficult it is maybe right now, but it's never been easy. And listen, if you're planning to make hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars investing your money, it's not going to be easy. So, you know, there's an interesting quote I know you've shared before that says, you know, like, for example, exercising is hard, but being super fat is also hard. You know, like it's all hard. It's hard to be broke. It's hard to do real estate and to get wealthy and to secure your financial future. None of it is meant to be easy, but if it's a game you want to play, this very well could be an entry point. Uh, and you're absolutely right about that, Patrick. We'll talk about that in one of the later segments. So more- well, yeah, And I want to say this, I just want to add to this, you know, history proves that the herd is almost always wrong. I'll actually go out to say, inevitably the herd is always wrong. So when the herd's going that way, you got to clear the clutter, get really dialed into what's happening and almost always go the opposite direction or at least a different direction. I, I had a mentor many years ago, uh, a dear mentor say to me, if everybody's going that way, I'm going that way. And, uh, and that's exactly what you have to do. You often have to be a contrarian in order to be successful uh, because as you said, her mentality rarely, rarely works. So let's get through a couple more charts. Patrick, I'm just going to rip through these charts and you could speak to them real quick because we got to move this show along. So let's go with this one. Well, you know, no surprise here. We start to see BC home sales tick down a little bit. This is where we're starting to see that affordability continue to impact. When you slip over to Alberta, it's the opposite effect. We're starting to see home sales on the rise. No surprise with that because of the number of people that are moving in, the quality of the people that are moving in in terms of income and the ability to earn and interprovincial migration. So in other words, they're not new immigrants. There are lots of new immigrants going into into Alberta, but there's lots of interprovincial who are established in Canada. They've got a credit rating. They're actually going to another job so they can actually buy. So you're starting to see sales uh, be, remain strong in Alberta, given the economy that's happening there. Ontario home sales, like British Columbia, starting to tick down. Things are softer, no doubt about it. This becomes affordability because prices are up there. But JG, I'm going to state it again. We've said it many times. Both it's, you it's, and I have. Well, you just you just said, hold on. You just said affordability because prices are up there. It's actually affordability because interest rates are up there because prices yes, sure. prices well, have both. come prices have come off their highs by by in some markets quite a bit. Yes, but when you look, we got to be careful about averages because we know that some of the prices come down are on the condominiums that also get logged, like they all get lumped into one big average. So we just got to be cautious about that. So we can clean that up. And that's, but you make a good point. The thing about Ontario home sales ticking down and affordability becomes the issue, whether it's the price of the unit or interest rates or a combination of all of that. What I'm saying is this, is that as rental housing providers, the point I want to make is that as costs are rising, there is many renters out there who have a very strong household income. In other words, they could have a couple hundred grand of a household income, but they don't have the down payment for a property. They can't qualify at the bank for any number of reasons. And they're renting units and they're looking for what? They're looking for a unit to rent that they would actually want to buy as their home. So the quality of that home the goes back to that detached unit uh, is really in demand. So I just want to say that, that we have to realize that the quality and the demographic of what we're seeing as renters is really shifted because of this affordability issue. And that's the point I want to make kind of in here. So at the end of the day, things are coming down sales in Ontario for any number of reasons and affordability, whatever makes that up is a primary cause. Listings, as you can see from this chart, listings have uh, gone up for sure. They've gone up uh, considerably in Canada. Now, regionally though, things are a little different. We're gonna show you some regional stuff in a second, so stay tuned for that. But active listings in BC have ticked up. Active listings in Alberta have ticked down. So you can start to see the different uh, provinces and how they're moving differently. Again, even within the provinces, and we're going to dig into Ontario here and actually show you the different regions of the GTA. It's a fascinating how there can be side by side. One's going up, one's going down. It's pretty crazy. We'll show you that in a second. Uh, active listings in Ontario have climbed recently. So that's very, very interesting what's happening. And this metric here, uh, Patrick, sales to new listing ratio, this is uh, what they use to, to determine whether or not a market is a buyer's market, a seller's market, or a balanced market. And as you can see here, uh, it's interesting what's happening, the difference between Alberta, BC, and Ontario, and where Canada fits into the averages 
in terms of if you average all, you know, all the provinces. But here's a good example of why looking at averages just doesn't work, Patrick. It doesn't. And this is really, you know, when you look at sales to new listing ratios, uh, there's no surprise that things are slowing down. But again, to your point, you know, we're it's just everything's averaged in there and you have to look at very specific markets. So sales to new listing ratios, uh, this is one of the reasons that you're also starting to see the big predictions of a crash and housing is going to go to zero or drop 40 percent or whatever the number is in the bubble. Uh, that's just not true. Uh, what we do need to consider in this slide that you've just put up in terms of condo completions. Well, guess what's coming on to the market? You know, aside from completions, JG, you've got a number of people that got into trouble. They bought those properties intending to assign. Now it's not assigning. So the condo market right now is a mess. And for predictions, I think the condo market uh, you're going to see all, you already have. But I think you're going to see uh, further price declines in many of the condo markets in the Toronto and GTA area for sure. Maybe not as much as in Vancouver because it's a different buyer. But can we get some that. can we get some timelines on your prediction? So let's so this is the condo price prediction we're making here, folks, live on Rain It In. We're each gonna do this. We're gonna have the PPI and the JGPI uh mm -hmm. uh the price prediction. So condos, you're saying prices are gonna pull back, prices are gonna decline. And yeah. you're saying that within which time frame? I mean, listen, it's a guess at best, but I think that you're going to start to see definitely over the next 12 months, you'll see a slow erosion of pricing. And again, it's going to be specific to some uh, Toronto uh, condos, and uh, but you're going to see the erosion for sure in pricing. And that's just strictly a number of units. Uh, I know a lot of people are saying, well, prices aren't going to come down. I disagree. I think in the condo market that those prices are going to come down. And a lot of that has to do with Number one, the volume that's coming on and the volume of people who are in trouble that need to get from underneath these deals because they bought with the intention of being able to sell at a profit and they can't. That's what I believe. Now, interesting though, Patrick, I think we, so my prediction, by the way, is that we're not going to get price declines, but we're going to get slower price growth, much slower price growth. But that's going to appear in the headlines as price declines because they often do that. They mistake slowing price growth with price declines, which is not the same thing. So just keep an eye out for that, folks, because I do think, and Patrick, you and I both agree, that this people will be yelling this from the rooftops, I think, during the winter season here when it starts to slow down, kind of that November, uh, December, January, February. I think you're going to see a lot of headlines around this. So it's important for investors to keep track of that. But also the type of uh, unit is really important, right, Patrick? Like you might have some really, really high-end condos that are like three bedroom, uh, 2,500 square foot, uh, three bathroom, uh, used to sell for $2 million. They might come off to $1.5 million, but maybe that two bedroom, one bathroom, 800 square foot, that one may go up in price. So the point is, is that we just got to watch these numbers as the price start to readjust, you might, you might not, you're not going to see all of them come down in price. You might see the average come down, or at least I certainly don't think they're going to come down, but that's, I'm just I, I'm cautioning people to be careful what they're looking at. Yeah, for sure. But, you know, there's a, there's a part of this that we, again, these averages and this big pot, they throw things into, but consider that if the, if the data is right, what they're saying is 30% of the condo market is owned by, we'll call them investors slash speculators. And so when you look at that volume of people that are in there as investors and uh, putting their capital to work and the, and the exit strategy that they have in mind, uh, there is a big, big chance that they're going to have to get from underneath those mortgages because a couple of years ago or three years ago, no problem qualifying for a mortgage at, you know, two, two and a half percent, three percent, whatever the number was, far lower than it is today. Now they have to qualify at double the interest rate and they're running into some challenges with that. So that's why I'm seeing that they will panic. People will have to get from underneath it. And with that, it always leads to discounted prices. Now, here's uh, some interesting updates before we wrap up this real estate market update. Uh, Vancouver has recently made some zoning changes, which I'm a big fan of zoning changes because this does have a material impact on builders' ability to get permits through. No doubt about it. This I'm a big fan of. So what's going on in Vancouver? Because Ontario went through this. And by the way, I've got I've got a ton of coach homes on the go right now, starting to work its way through the system. And uh, and it's just beginning. I think we're about to go through a heyday in Ontario the next five to 10 years for coach homes. 
but I digress. Tell us what's happening in Vancouver. Well, they did exactly the same thing in Vancouver. I, I don't want to say exactly the same. They basically did the same thing in Vancouver as what you have done in Ontario. This is not a provincial initiative. This is a Vancouver initiative and a Vancouver city initiative. So it is a, it is a big deal for Vancouver, and I think it'll have an impact. It's really going to depend on will builders step up given the cost of capital can they get the ROI that they want? Can they get the labor that they want? And of course, there's wage growth that's going on, right? You know, that they're fighting and, and there's some headwinds, right? So there's a lot of things going on, but this is definitely a move in the right direction. Stop being so pessimistic on it. This is a damn good thing, buddy. Enough with the pessimism. This is a really good thing. And I'll tell you, we're starting to have this happen though, Patrick, which is good, is municipalities are starting to up each other, which I like. So what happened in Ontario is the provincial government said, Across all of Ontario, you have to allow a minimum of three units on any zoning. That's what happened in Ontario. Then Hamilton came out and said, okay, we hear you, province of Ontario. We're going to allow up to four units. So they upped the province. Now Vancouver's come out and said, we're going to allow up to six units or eight if they're rentals on a single house lot. Hey, that is some serious density, Patrick. That's from one to eight. That's a huge difference. And that makes all the difference when you're running your numbers as a developer to be able to squeeze eight units into something that formerly you could only do one or two uh absolutely game changer so i'm a big fan and the fact that each individual municipality is starting to come out with this we saw edmonton do it we talked about that i think three four months ago so i mean this is great it's starting it's moving across the system much faster than i thought it would patrick and i'm a big fan i'm all about the positivity here I, I get it. And I'm not that, it's that I'm not a big fan. I'm looking at it and saying, okay, well, what does this mean? Well, for Vancouver City, it's a big deal. Got it. It's a population of under a million people. It's like 700,000 people. So does it have an impact on Vancouver City? For sure. But it's not a province-wide initiative. So that's my only point around all it'll, of that. So, Abbotsford will follow for, you know, the, all, all the cities will follow, dude. They, 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 they all got to follow suit. <laughs> or the provinces are going to do. You just wait. I'll make that a prediction that okay. within, within two years, it's moving faster than I thought. So I'm going to say within two years, many of the major cities, and when I say major cities, I mean anything over 100,000 people will come out with their own uh, zoning changes that are going to help uh, developers move in this direction. Now, I mean, and they need to. But as investors, if you're worried about supply, oh my gosh, I got these rental units now, it's going to be oversupplied. This is years in the making of where it's going oh, to change. So, the yeah, that's good. I'm glad you brought that up, Patrick, because some people might be thinking that. They might be thinking like, oh, you know, this is going to be a problem for you. It won't be a problem for you, by the way. Let's look at the recent CMHC report that just came out that is predicting up to 4 million housing units will be a, have a shortage of up to 4 million houses by 2030. Um, this is quite shocking. And a good thing for us real estate investors, because it's price security for us, it lowers our risk and it tells us where we're going up to 2030, we're very safe. Yeah, and these are the, this is always the data. So it goes always back to what we say. This is a great opportunity for investors to stay focused, stay mindful, be really diligent and kind of, uh, we're, we'll talk about it in a minute, but be very precise in their strategy and where they're investing. If you like what you learned here, Go to the description below and subscribe for our free insiders newsletter where you can also stay up to date for our upcoming events and our courses. If you want to see more stuff like this, click here. If you want to see the entire show, click there.